Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having me here. Uh, let me just uh, give you some overview of some things that are on my radar and uh, on my uh, priorities list or reprioritize list, whatever the case might be. Um, first of all, my uh, management style, I believe in getting the five pillars uh, together and make decisions based on those five pillars, and that would be legal, policy, budget, legislative, and communications, uh, meaning press, uh, messaging, if you will. Uh, just as of yesterday, the full team was put into place. We had our press secretary come on board, uh, Ms. Gresh, Katie Gresh, who all of you have probably seen uh, on many, many occasions uh, being a spokesperson for uh, DEP. Um, most of you know Tom Santana, who's with me today. He's our legislative director, and uh, those two pillars to me I'm going to be focusing on in terms of going forward and making them more proactive and more strategic. Uh, I think on the legislative front, for sure, I would like to see our relationships uh, with the legislature be enriched and be deeper and be more uh, strategic. Uh, certainly, constituent service is also what we're about, and I want to let you all know that that is part of, the, uh, uh, part of what we do as well. Um, but I'm also thinking on a bigger and broader uh, scope for my legislative uh, uh, relationships. Uh, communications also, uh, press, communications, messaging. I think the department has a role in messaging and communications, and uh, we need to uh, we need to play that role. We need to combat this information. We need to put out the right information. And uh, we need to assure that the public uh, at large is getting uh, the facts and uh, not, the, uh, not the headlines, not the emotion, not the fiction. So those are two uh, uh, areas that I'll be focusing on. I'll be focusing on others. Uh, uh, but I wanted to bring those two uh, to your attention here. Um, in terms of what I do, I've, I've said to all of you, and I said to public, uh, my job, and the governor's told me my job is to protect public safety and the environment, period. Um, and, however, that would be done based on sound science, based on the facts, not based on emotion, not based on fiction. And it'll be done in a deliberative way, uh, not a knee jerk way. Um, and uh, it, it will be done transparently. It will be done open to uh, comment. It will be open to input and suggestion from all stakeholders, all members of the public, uh, anybody on an informal and a formal basis. We obviously have a lot of formal processes for input. Um, but um, I will sit down with any one of you, any one of your colleagues in the Senate, anytime, anywhere. Um, and I'll meet with anybody, really, quite honestly, who wants to uh, chat with me and tell me what they're thinking. Um, on the topic of bad science, I want to give you some examples of what I see lately as bad science. Um, and they've been uh, reported uh, prominently. One is the, uh, the Cornell University report by Dr. Hobarth regarding the carbon footprint of gas. Um, that has uh, generated a lot of uh, criticism, even from uh, uh, the, the environmental community, the Environmental Defense Fund, has said that that has overstated emissions by at least 75 percent. Um, so that is what I consider a, a suspect science. Uh, another piece of, uh, and there are others, but I'll just give you two. Uh, the other one that comes to mind is what was released on April 16th by the Federal House Democrats' report on fracking fluid. Uh, that report was really unconscionable. In its uh, misrepresentation of facts and its uh, misrepresentation of risk um, and so-called carcinogenic risk, uh, totally ignoring the uh, media by which those uh, elements that they did identify were identified as carcinogenic and totally uh, uh, misstating that the, uh, uh, the water is 99 plus percent water. Um, so I would put those two things in the uh, basket of bad science, uh, a lot more political science really than, than hard science there. Um, one of the things we'll be doing at the department, and the governor's talked about it, is getting back to basics, uh, doing what the department does, uh, practicing geology, practicing hydrogeology, writing permits. Um, I talked to, a, and I talked to all the EP employees, I'm going around to meet all 2,600 of them, I'm about, uh, I think, more than halfway there. I think I've got to, I have two more regions. I've got to four of the six. 
I've spoken to everybody up and down the line, uh, program directors, regional directors, uh, the uh, clerical staff, you name it. Um, I, I speak to everybody, and including inspectors. Um, but one conversation really struck me, it was with a geologist. Um, and she told me that she was spending sometimes 20 hours a week, half of her week, uh, managing loan documents, uh, checking off to see whether certain solar projects had been put in place properly and whether the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. And, and I, I was intrigued by that, and I had to ask her. I said, well, uh, uh, wouldn't you be happier uh, doing geology work instead of uh, doing loan document work? And, you know, she was, um, I put her on the spot, um, but she said, you know, uh, yeah, that's what I went to school for. I went to school to be a geologist, and I came to the department to protect the environment with my, with my trade. Uh, and my thought was that she wanted to be a loan officer. Well, she could have gone to school and become a loan officer and worked at a bank. But that's not what she does. Or that's not what she's uh, went to school for and came to DEP for. So uh, when we get back to basics and focus on what we're supposed to be doing as a department, uh, instead of uh, uh, those other things, we will improve our morale. Because uh, I know that geologist will be happier practicing geology than she will be doing loan documents. We'll also take care of the public's business better. We'll be able to, uh, I'll get fewer calls about permits that are uh, stuck in, um, in a review process and, and uh, endlessly in a review process because I have geologists out doing loan documents instead of practicing geology. Uh, so that'll be a win-win. We'll get better morale and we'll get better service and we'll get better scientific practice uh, on the ground. Um, another thing we've seen lately uh, that I have to mention and comment on is um, attacks, attacks on DEP and attacks on DEP personnel. And this comes from all uh, sides. Um, there, there was an article a couple of weeks ago about uh, certain uh, named four permit writers uh, who write oil and gas permits, uh, accusing them by name of, uh, of really uh, uh, dereliction and not doing their job. and. and uh, this was a, a matter leaked by a, a, a lawyer, a lawyer fighting a case, litigating a case that he brought against the prior administration uh, in a permit case, and he decided he was going to get some snippets on a deposition and then give them to the press and let him uh, try the case in the press. Well, I, you know, the reporter doesn't know the full story. The lawyer does. The lawyer knows what the full permitting ramifications are in an oil and gas permit, that the drill permit is simply a permit to turn the drill bit and nothing more, uh, that, um, that there's a Chapter 78 uh, well casing uh, regulation uh, package that, that is self-executing and applies to those to those drillings and uh, is not part of the permit process because it's part of the process that we implemented in our regulation. That lawyer knows that uh, there's an erosion and sedimentation control process, separate process, from the oil and gas permit itself, the drilling permit, that, that governs to make sure that there is no uh, uh, leakage of sediment into the river. That lawyer knows all that, but that lawyer didn't want to tell that story, obviously, because that lawyer wants to win his case. Uh, and he wants to misrepresent uh, the facts and take facts out of context, and that's exactly what he did. And he marched it into the uh, reporter, and the reporter prints it, the next thing you know, we get the, uh, the, the quote, rubber stamp. Um, which uh, is a uh, uh, unconscionable in terms of its uh, lack of um, uh, uh, relationship to reality. Uh, but you know what? I signed up for my job to be named in the press and criticized in the press, and I've got two comics out there about me now, apparently, and I think I'm leading my fellow cabinet members two to nothing. And I actually think I might be leading the governor two to nothing on that. I'm not sure. I haven't checked that. So I signed up for that. And that's part of my job description. And I'm used to it. Um, I've been around the state. I ran for statewide office once. So it's part of the part of the job description for me. It's not part of the job description for four permit writers in the Northwest. And it's not part of the job description for a, uh, uh, another member of my staff who was taken, uh, who was having a meeting with EPA. Uh, another outfit attacking the department lately. Um, having a, a meeting with EPA on the program basis level uh, about water, and which is what we do all the time, we've done all the time, and goodness, we need to do it. Um, uh, well, within a week, I think it was 10 days, I counted the days, 
the quote transcript of that meeting appear on the New York Times by uh, one of the reporters and quotation marks and was it again taken out of context, printed in the way the Times reporter wanted to print it, but I thought to myself, uh, and, and the, the article reported that the uh, quote transcript, and I don't believe it was a transcript at all, uh, I think that was either an error or an intentional error, I don't know, because when you call something a transcript, it has additional credibility that it wouldn't have otherwise if it were just those. Um, I know that as a lawyer, but, um, and I, I know you all do too, but uh, when was the last time any of you, uh, apparently it was a Freedom of Information Act request to the EPA that got this quote transcript into the New York Times within a week or 10 days. And I thought to myself as a lawyer, as a, as a person who used to work in business, uh, when was the last time I ever heard of a Freedom of Information Act request being filed and responded to and in the New York Times within 10 days? And I had to scratch my head because I didn't remember that ever happening on, uh, in my experience of that happening so fast. So um, th this is the world we live in, a fishbowl, where even our, uh, uh, our technical personnel end up being on the New York Times the next day. Um, and uh, in, in many ways unfair. Again, it's my job to take that heat. It's not their job to be... Uh, to be flayed in the press, and especially flayed unfairly and out of context. So I've told our people that, look, um, you do your job, you focus on your job, and I will have your back. I will speak out at the times that are necessary to protect you in doing your job properly. Because uh, they don't have an outlet. They can't talk to the committee like I'm doing today. They can't talk to the press like I can or, th or through my press secretary can. They don't have that ability to set the record straight. Um, and uh, I told them I would have their back on that. Um, and that gets me to another topic, and that is the, the rumor, the questions uh, that have been floating around uh, by our partners at EPA, by others, that, gee, uh, the DEP doesn't know what it's doing, it doesn't know how to regulate the gas industry, it doesn't know how to do this, it doesn't know how to do that. Um, a fascinating dynamic because uh, just a year ago, uh, the head of the drinking water department at EPA, a guy named Stephen Heer, uh, is quoted widely as saying the states are doing a fine job regulating the oil and gas program. Um, and uh, we had a report by a outfit called Stronger, which is a nonpartisan uh, review group, an audit group that reviewed Pennsylvania's program and said Pennsylvania is doing a good job. Uh, it's doing what it's doing. So. What I see happening is sort of the converse of the, uh, <coughs> of the uh, famous Mark Twain uh, story about you know, your father's really stupid when you're 13, but boy, was I surprised how much you've learned when I turned 21. It's almost the opposite. It's uh, how uh, feckless and, uh, and competent we've gotten since January 19. Uh, so I'm going to stand on my uh, pulpit all the time, and I'm going to repeat to the EPA I'm going to repeat to this committee and every committee and everybody who will listen that the department is on the job, that the department is doing the job, that the department knows how to do the job, and we're doing a good job. Uh, and I've been uh, outside this department for years as a judge, and now I'm inside it, and uh, I feel as though I'm uh, with 2,600 of the most confident, best folks that, uh, that I could be with, and I'm proud to be with every one of them. Um, I want to also talk about enforcement. I want to leave a legacy at the department as an enforcer, a tough enforcer. I work for a, uh, a governor who used to be a prosecutor, used to be a federal prosecutor, used to be a state attorney general, as you know. And his message to me was, uh, you be an enforcer. And that's what I've always been. Uh, so we really meshed together on that. I, uh, as some of you know, um, what I did, I'll always point to my opinion in the Leeward construction case, and I think I've said that to many of the members here. It's a two-page concurring opinion I wrote in 2001, 10 years ago. Um, and the gist of the opinion was uh, we had just fined a construction company, we meaning the board, because the board under that act imposes the penalty. A uh, quarter of a million dollars, which sounds like a lot of money. That's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But my question was, is it enough? Uh, I, did, I wanted to know from the balance sheets whether this company made any profit from this job. 
is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's just the cost of doing business, and they still walked away with a million dollars. I don't know that. And I took D, I took DEP to task. I said, "How come you didn't present this evidence? Um, you should present this evidence." And I've been preaching that message for ten years. You, you need to show me this evidence about economic <coughs> benefit that might have been obtained from violation. And this was a recidivist, repeat, bad actor violator. And uh, being a free market economist I am, I was schooled at the University of Virginia, which is uh, sister to the University of Chicago. Milton, it, most people at Shea Guevara on the wall have said this in their dorm rooms. I had Milton Friedman. So um, to me, when you cheat um, and uh, don't do the appropriate protections that are required by law, you're like, as I said uh, the other day to, uh, uh, in an interview, it's like steroids in baseball. You're cheating. And that's bad for the market. But what's worse is it's bad for the market and it's polluting. And uh, that combination is uh, is deadly. It cannot be allowed to uh, to exist. Um, so I'm going to be tough on enforcement uh, within the bounds of the law. Um, we we've already been um, down that road at DEP since I've been there. Uh, a lot of these cases are well publicized, but. Uh, we, we've done it. We've shut down two operations already within a day of learning that we needed to shut them down to protect the water in both cases. One was, uh, they're both oil and gas, one was Marcellus, one wasn't. Um, but uh, in all cases, we worked as a team within DEP within a day to do it. And under the Gas Act, as you all know, a shutdown order that says stop drilling needs to be approved by me personally, it needs to be approved by the secretary or his designate, which in this case is the uh, field ops secretary. But uh, one of them was at, uh, at Galeton up in Potter County, and I don't know whether we had some Potter County folks here or, or listening, but the uh, borough authority, the water authority wrote to us right after the incident, and I want to read the letter because I think it's important to get it on the uh, record. This is from Galeton Borough uh, Water Authority. Um, authority would like to express our sincere gratitude immediate response from your department in the situation that we encountered in our watershed this past week. The issues that our operator had to deal with could have been much worse and our community could have suffered severely had it not been for the efforts and support we received from you. This was a letter to our regional program director, not to me personally. Um, the situation reinforces our belief that the interest and importance of our water source is of utmost importance to all and that the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection works hard to sustain this valuable resource. Again, on behalf of the authority and all members of our community, thank you for your prompt response and support. Um, now this is, uh, I don't know that that was reported in the press, um, but uh, they appreciated what we did and I appreciated that they appreciated it. Um, as you all know, we made a call last week regarding water safety to the <coughs> operators to stop sending uh, the shale gas wastewater to these quote grandfather facilities. Uh, I think that was a very important step and uh, I, I look at it as a big victory because we had compliance within 28 hours instead of 28 months that it would have taken had we gone another route and had to go through litigation or had to go through permit uh, renewal processes. Um, and um, what we did is Again, being an economist, I focused first on the supply side. I said if I could drive the supply, I wouldn't even have to worry about the demand side. And so that's why our call went to the, for the first instance to the drillers. And uh, I've been in a company that does things very responsibly and took very seriously its duties. And I thought that the companies that I would be issuing the call to would be the same way. I've been in their chair, I've been in their seat. So I had all confidence that they would respond, and they did. They responded. Within 28 hours, I got a letter saying that uh, we will comply. Um, so I look at that as a big victory, a uh, big victory in terms of how we did it. And I stand on the fact that, uh, that it's a done deal, that uh, we got the compliance and we got it uh, immediately, really. Um, on, the, uh, on another topic of enforcement, uh, there's been a lot of press about notices of violations and uh, what, uh, what inspectors do in the field. Uh, I'm here to tell you that inspectors were never under an order or a directive or anything else to clear it through Mike Prancer or anybody else in central office to write notices of violation. That story was 
blown way out of proportion. It was never the case, um, although I saw in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette today that we have, quote, rescinded the policy. So, uh, and that's fine. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether you live in the, you know, the good Captain Kirk world or the bad Captain Kirk world, as long as you get to the same result. And the result is inspectors aren't uh, being, uh, uh, having to clear any NOVs uh, through, through either me or others in central office. Um, what I am doing is uh, focusing on consistency, and I'm, at, I'm tasking the folks to look at NOVs that have been issued in the past and that will be issued in about the next couple of months <clears throat> to make sure that they're defensible, to make sure they're consistent, to make sure they're logical, and to make sure that they focus on uh, matters of environmental importance. And that's the advice I'm giving to my inspectors and to all the program people. Write your NOVs so they're clear, so they're concise, so that you, Mr. Inspector, can come to court, stand up, and defend what you did. Uh, because that's what you're going to have to do in this day and age. You're going to have to go to court and defend it. And I've been a judge for 10 years, and I've seen dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of enforcement cases. And what I do as a judge, what they all do, and believe me, what the lawyers do, they read every single inspection report. They read every single NOV. Then they match it up against the enforcement action. And if there's any chinks in that armor along the way, that's where the cross-examination comes in. And I did, that's what I did for a number of years. So I've been in that chair. I've cross-examined DEP people. Um, and uh, I know what it's like to be in that seat um, and, and uh, what it's like to need to defend your action. And they do. They need to be able to stand up to the legal eagles that will come at them and uh, with all uh, guns and blazing. And sometimes uh, David and Goliath uh, type of atmosphere where you've got, uh, as a judge, and I saw cases where you have three or four lawyers on the, on the one side, and then you had DEP. Uh, so it is a crucible for those uh, enforcers and for those uh, program people. And I want to make sure that they're able to stare down the best corporate lawyers, the best litigators, the Clarence Darrows out there, and walk away winners. Um, and I've seen too many cases as a judge where that didn't take place. But under my watch, I, I want none of those cases to exist. I want to win every case that we bring, because we wouldn't bring the case unless we're meritorious. Um, on the, uh, the well failure of Bradford, I want to touch on that, because that's a topic that's also been of great interest uh, lately. Um, Chesapeake, uh, we issued an NOV this Good Friday, um, for noon on Good Friday, and uh, we have, I think, received the information that we demanded in that NOV, notice of violation. Um, we had some really hard questions we need answered. Um, why did it take so long to get the uh, well capper out there? That's one question I sure have, and, and I better get a good answer to it, um, because I'm not, uh, I'm not going to stop until I do. Uh, they have, they're in a stand down of fracking right now, Chesapeake is, and we checked it out uh, to make sure that was the case. They told us that was the case, but uh, I directed our inspectors to go out there and check it out to make sure that was the case, and that happened uh, two weeks ago, or the week of the incident. Um, and uh, they need or shut down. We also had our inspectors check out their equipment of the wells that they were fracking in Pennsylvania. There were five in Bradford, or four in Bradford, four or five in Bradford, and one in the Southwest. Um, and so that, uh, that was done. Um, and they're still in stand down mode um, until we can be satisfied that they've taken steps that will prevent a repeat of this. Um, I've talked about consistency already. Uh, it is going to be one of my priorities. It's one of the governor's priorities. <coughs> can't have a situation where the same law is uh, interpreted differently and applied differently in Philadelphia than it is in Williamsport, than it is in Pittsburgh. Um, as a legal scholar, which I pretend to be, uh, that's not the way the law works. And I'm sure that's not the way the law is designed when you pass it. You design one law for the state of Pennsylvania, and that's the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a, a regional law. Um, I, I want to prioritize brownfields at the department. I want to reinvigorate our brownfields program and make that a priority. Uh, we have a ton of opportunity back on that in Pennsylvania, and we have a lot of brownfield sites and a lot of brownfields opportunities and a lot of economic dynamic that can be brought to bear there. So I want to bring brownfields from a sort of backwater um, uh, 
situation that it was and put it up in the prominent front end. Uh, on energy, you're going to see some changes in the way energy policy is done by this administration. Uh, in the past, I think you're used to a model where the DEP secretary was the do all and end all for energy policy. And I'm talking about marketing, uh, allocation, um, and things like that. Well, I, you're not going to see that anymore. You're going to see the DEP chief as part of that process in the administration of uh, advising and formulating energy policy, but the DEP secretary and the DEP is not going to be the only player at that table anymore. Um, we're going to have other cabinet level folks participating as well, and we're going to have, uh, as you probably have met, Patrick Henderson, the energy executive, making sure that the uh, energy policy of this governor and this administration is coordinated. Um, we spent, uh, I talked about it with the geologists, we spent a lot of time in the last few years administering our, our grants, the um, stimulus funding. Our is coming to an end, and um, for better or for worse, it's a reality. It's coming to an end, and those dollars aren't going to be there. I think Pennsylvania is about 80 percent done, all of its own funding, and uh, um, quite honestly, I think that geologist, um, you know, all broad economic issues aside, is going to be relieved that she doesn't have to do that anymore. She can practice geology. Um, I'm going to look at retooling what we do in that regard, or have done in that regard, as in, uh, in terms of doing more environmental outreach, more environmental education. I think environmental education needs to be reprioritized. I think compliance assistance needs to be reprioritized and pollution prevention. Uh, on a programmatic level, uh, my message is, to, is, and I've talked to many of you about this, be more uh, cross-disciplinary and multidisciplinary in your approach to programs. Air is not done in isolation from water, in isolation from ENS, in isolation from oil and gas. They all interrelate to each other. And that's been the story of environmental law and environmental science since probably it was invented. Uh, you, you can't impact one media without some impact on another. Um, and they all interrelate to each other. So siloing the media is not the way I think good environmental stewardship and environmental practice is, is done. Um, on uh, Marcella Shale, obviously a big issue. Um, and uh, my, my job there is to protect the water. Uh, I'm very cognizant of the economic opportunities that this offers and the geopolitical significance of what this offers. Um, the ability to wean ourselves from being dependent uh, upon foreign sources, foreign unfriendly sources, and being at their mercy for our energy supplies. I'm very aware of all that, and that's very important. Um, we're blessed to be able to have that opportunity. And I've seen in the northern tier the way the jobs are being created, thousands of jobs. The unemployment rates in those communities up there are what uh, we economists call full employment. 4.5 whatever percent is full employment. And where else are you seeing that? In the United States, in this troubled time. So it's clearly transformational, it's clearly game-changing, and it's game-changing because this fuel has a potential today. Within the last few years, I think this has been changed from a transitional fuel to a fuel of the century. The fuel of the 21st century, uh, just like oil was the fuel of the last century, and coal the century before that, and wood the century before that, gas could be the fuel of the 21st century. Um, and what, I, what I've seen programmatic-wise, and I think this, um, I want to bring it down to what DEP does, it, I've inherited what I think is a, is a balkanized program um, of uh, uh, the way we handle ourselves. You know, we've got three different regions at a central office, all with a, quote, piece of doing Marcellus Shale and regulating it. And we've got some permit writing in the Northwest being done for the Northeast. And I'm not happy with that. I think we can do better in terms of bringing it more together and more uh, in a unitary uh, a focus. And uh, I'm looking for ideas on that. I'm looking for input on that, both internally um, and externally. I think I'd like to leave the department with a less um, uh, balkanized structure with respect to the um, uh, to, with respect to the organizational regulation of Marcellus Shale. 
So again, any ideas, I'm delighted to have and delighted to take uh, on that. Um, at the end of the day, I think we need and we want a diverse energy portfolio. We want some nuclear, we want some coal, because coal's not going anywhere. Contrary to popular belief, coal is going to be with us for a while. Uh, we also need wind and solar. Uh, we need gas. We need all these things uh, to be uh, agile on the energy front. Um, there, there was a great Atlantic Monthly article in December by James Fallows. It was called Dirty Coal, Clean Future. The message there was, uh, don't pretend, don't live in a false world that says coal is uh, not going to be here for a while. It is going to be here for a while. Whether we like it or not, we need it, and it's going to be here. Um, and renewables are part of the mix, too. But the question that uh, uh, Mr. Fallis posed, and this is a good one, and I've told, you some, I've told somebody this, take it, take it on your cocktail party mix or, or routine, because I already have, and I live in the southeast, like some of you do, where uh, gas is not really as uh, prominent or in the news as, um, uh, as it is in other parts of the state. But here's the question that Mr. Fallows posed, and I think it's an interesting one. Uh, are you prepared to turn off your refrigerator, turn off your HDTV, have your kids, are your kids willing to turn off their iPods, their iPads, their uh, music machines and all that for 30 years while we get uh, our act together on renewables? Well, I think the answer is no. We're not willing to do that. And even if we were, <coughs> are the Chinese willing to do that? Are the Indians willing to do that? Is everybody else in the world willing to do that? The answer is no. But the bottom line is, um, we do need that diverse portfolio. Um, and that's a reality. And I think that uh, the best we can serve a diverse portfolio, the better. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, my job is to make sure that gas is done and gas is done right and to protect the